Once again, welcome to the tutorials on dynamic system modeling and control. Um, in this particular tutorial, we're going to look at the uh, state space modeling of a very simple mass air spring system. Once again, my name is Hossam Fathi, and um, it's great to have you in this tutorial. Um, moving to the goals of this particular tutorial, it's it, they really boil down to just one goal, but I'm going to sort of express it in three different ways. Um, I want to present to you a simple example of the state space modeling of a very, very simple pneumatic system. In doing so, I want to explore the use of the ideal gas law for the state space modeling of pneumatic systems. And the particular system I'm interested in in this tutorial is a mass air spring system, and I want to develop a state space model of this system. So before we go any further, um, I want to point out that um, that this set of tutorials on dynamic system modeling, uh, this particular rendition of this set of tutorials is um, going to be fairly brief in terms of its coverage of pneumatic systems and hydraulic systems. We're not going to go in deep detail into the state space modeling of pneumatic and hydraulic systems. So um, it's important that uh, you have further references for the study of these topics if you're interested. And uh, what I've done here is I've uh, listed for you three of um, some of the best references on the state space modeling of pneumatic and hydraulic systems. There are many great references on the topic. These are uh, definitely three of the best ones. Uh, the textbook by William Palm III uh, titled uh, System Dynamics um, is certainly a great reference for studying the state space modeling of pneumatic and hydraulic systems. Um, Dean Carnop, Ronald, Ronald Rosenberg's, and Donald Margolis's book, um, Carnop, Mar Margolis, and uh, Rosenberg, um, their book System Dynamics Modeling Simulation and Control of Mechatronic Systems is also a great reference on the topic. And uh, last but not least, Boyden Kulakowski, uh, John Gardner's, and Lowen Shearer's book on the dynamic modeling and control of engineering systems is also a great reference for further study. So I'm not going to go into the state space modeling of pneumatic and hydraulic systems um, in as much detail uh, as these three references. And so it's great to be able to refer to these uh, for additional information. Moving straight on to the system that is motivating uh, this study. The system is essentially a mass on an air spring. Now what this could represent in a real life is a city bus that has a uh, air cushion based suspension instead of a um, instead of a, a rigid mechanical suspension or a spring based not rigid but a spring based mechanical suspension in other words we have uh, an object that has a mass a translational mass that is sitting on a cushion that is filled with air and um, the first obvious insight that we can um, we can obtained by looking at the system is that this air spring or air cushion is fundamentally analogous to a mechanical spring. Uh, it provides a reaction force that is somehow related to how much it is displaced, how much it is compressed, much the same way as a mechanical spring provides a reaction force uh, that is a function of how much it is compressed. So it makes sense in this case to have two state variables one representing the degree to which we compress this air cushion or spring and one representing the velocity of the mass essentially representing potential and kinetic energy so I'm gonna select the first state variable as being the volume of the air inside the spring and the second state variable as being the velocity of the mass and I'm gonna make that positive upwards I would like to write down state equations governing the dynamics of the system the first state equation is relatively easy. The rate of change of the volume of the air inside the spring is uh, equal to the cross-sectional area of the of the spring system of the cylinder. If we pretend that this cushion uh, is essentially air compressed in inside a cylinder, we have the area of this cushion multiplied by the velocity. So area times velocity gives us rate of change of volume with respect to time. In other words, x1 dot is a times x2. The second state equation will take a little more thinking on our part. Um, the equation for x2 dot. Obviously, x2 dot is rate of change of velocity with respect to time, which is acceleration. And so, obviously, uh, 
we need to um, use an equation of motion to obtain acceleration in terms of the system state variables. In order to write down an equation of motion, we need to be able to essentially come up with expressions for all of the forces acting on the mass m. One of the forces is going to be gravity pushing the mass m downwards. But the other force is going to be the force due to the pressure from the air spring. So we need to be able to model the pressure from this air spring. So this brings us to the second uh, insight. If this spring is filled with air, and if air behaves as an ideal gas, then the pressure from this air spring is governed by the ideal gas law, which is that pressure times volume is equal to nRT, number of moles, times ideal gas constant, times temperature. So all of a sudden now we've introduced a new variable that is not a state variable, at least not in our analysis so far, which is temperature. So what do we do about temperature? How do we um, basically capture the relationship between changes in volume of the, of the air spring and changes in temperature of the air spring? Well, if you recall some of the standard assumptions from thermodynamics, you could assume that the expansion and compression of the air in the spring is isothermal, in which case the temperature T is constant, which means that nRT is constant, which means that the product P times V is constant. I'm going to refer to this constant to C1, so PV is equal to C1, which then automatically implies that P is equal to C1 over V. But remember, V is the volume of this chamber, so the pressure P is equal to C1 over X1 where x1 is the first state variable, the volume of the air inside the spring or inside this chamber. This gives me a relationship for pressure in terms of volume, which allows us to write down the second state equation. The acceleration x2 dot is going to equal 1 over the mass m multiplied by the summation of forces. There's a gravitational force mg acting downward, so we have a negative mg and then there is pressure from the air spring equal to C1 over X1 acting upwards and trying to push the mass up. So we have plus C1 over X1. Now, to assume that the temperature of the air inside this air spring is constant is to actually make an assumption regarding the rate at which the spring is compressed or expanded, at which the air in the spring is compressed or expanded. You see, when you take air and you compress it, it tends to warm up. And the only way that you can achieve an isothermal expansion is if you can reject the heat generated, or isothermal compression, I apologize, is if you can reject the heat that is produced by this compression to the outside environment so fast that temperature appears to be constant all the time. The same is true for expansion. Air cools down when you uh, make it expand, when you... Um, basically take an air chamber and you increase its volume mechanically, the air in the chamber tends to cool down. And you need to be able to bring in heat from the outside fast enough to the point where the temperature of the air remains constant even as the chamber is expanding. So what this means is that the assumption of isothermal expansion and compression essentially amounts to an assumption the, the compression and expansion process, the vibrations of the system, um, happen at a slow enough pace to the point where heat transfer is able to bring in heat from the outside or reject heat to the outside to the point where the temp temperature of this um, compressed air chamber remains constant. The temperature inside this compressed air chamber remains constant. Now, Normally, when you think of the vibrations of a mass mounted on a spring, uh, like an air spring, let's say because the mass is the mass of a vehicle and the, sp uh, the air spring represents the suspension of the vehicle, normally you think of these vibrations as happening at a fairly fast frequency, which um, intuitively may not allow for heat transfer fast enough to keep the temperature of the container constant. As a matter of fact, if the expansion and compression process happens sufficiently fast, you may not have time for any appreciable air heat transfer. In which case, the opposite extreme of the set of assumptions you can make from thermodynamics is perhaps more applicable. In other words, 
it may be more appropriate to assume that the expansion and the compression of the air inside this air spring is adiabatic as opposed to isothermal. If the expansion and compression of the air is adiabatic as opposed to isothermal, without going into a lot of detail, um, essentially thermodynamics tells us that under some additional assumptions, the product of pressure and volume raised to the power gamma, where gamma is a constant that depends on the gas that we're considering, the product PV to the power of gamma is itself constant, and we're going to label that constant as C2 in which case pressure is not a constant over volume, it's a constant over volume to the power of gamma, and volume being um, x1, pressure is C2 over x1 to the power of gamma. So when we plug that into the equation for x2 dot, now we have that x2 dot is 1 over the mass m multiplied by negative mg, force from gravity, plus the force from the air spring, but now the force from the air spring is C2 divided by X1 to the power of gamma. We see that we have two different state space models of this mass air spring system. Depending on what we assume for the compression and expansion process of the air in the spring, whether it's isothermal or adiabatic or something else, the ideal gas law provides us with the ability to at least begin developing state space models of pneumatic systems but the ideal gas law is not enough we need to make additional assumptions regarding the thermodynamics of the expansion and compression process this uh, really doesn't do full justice to the modeling of pneumatic dynamic systems it just gives you a glimpse of what the modeling of pneumatic systems uh, looks like of what the process of modeling a pneumatic system looks like. So the goals of this tutorial were not really to make you an expert on the modeling of pneumatic dynamic systems, but rather just to show you one simple example of how you can develop state-based models of pneumatic systems. That was the first goal. And sort of different ways of expressing that goal, we wanted to explore the use of the ideal gas law in particular for the state-based modeling of pneumatic systems. And we wanted to model a uh, mass air spring system using the state space language. Thank you very, very much for uh, listening to this tutorial, and I look forward to the next one.